When my daughter, Elise, was six, she went to school one day and the teacher asked her what she wanted to be when she grew up, what kind of career she wanted, and she said, I want to be a girl guide leader. Now, she didn't really understand that some jobs were for pay and some jobs were not. And when she had been asked that question, I had been a girl, a girl guide, which is Canadian form of Girl Scouts. I'd been a girl guide leader for about 12 years, and I had done most everything from being a brownie leader to sitting on as a member on the Ontario Council running the province of Girl, Scout, of girl Guides in Canada. I think what Elise was connecting to when she said she wanted to be a Girl Scout leader as a career when she grew up was was that essence or the mission of girl guiding and girl scouting which is to build girls of courage, confidence, character who would make the world a better place. And Elise had accompanied me since birth to numerous meetings and she herself was a brownie so I think she really truly had a feel of what it would be like to be a girl scout leader. And besides, scouting and guiding is a lot of fun. The anthropological definition of happiness is to have as little separation between one's work and one's play. Now, I am not suggesting that we take our computers and cell phones on vacation with us and blur those boundaries between work and personal time, but I am saying that when our work comes from our passion in life, it feels like play. We enjoy our work, and our work gives us hope when it is our vocation. Work is an activity involving mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a certain purpose or result. The word vocation comes from the Latin word vocare, meaning to call. It's a term for an occupation to which a person is particularly drawn, or they have particular skills for, or they've had particular training for. Christians understand this word vocation as the work that God has called them to. God created mankind with a purpose, to care for one another and to care for the earth. This mission has evolved into various means of work in which we participate to provide for our families and for ourselves. Being paid for work is important. It alleviates our financial needs, but money is a human invention. Pay for work is a system of trade, but it's rarely the sole purpose for our work. Work gives us a sense of productivity a sense of completion. Work uses our creativity and our problem-solving skills. Um, well, we want our labor to make a difference in the world, so work can be a means to an end, or it can also be a meaningful way of sharing our gifts to make the world a better place. It's good to be rewarded for our work. Sometimes, though, our desires get skewed and we come to expect exaggerated rewards for our work or we start to seek and, and abuse the power that comes from that position of work. For example, a county executive who has been indicted on corruption charges for allegedly using county employees to arrange sexual liaisons or to work on the executive's re-election campaign, or to run personal errands, has misused his power. Now the disciples had not quite walked down the path of corruption, but they certainly had misunderstood the substance of the work that Jesus called them to. Jesus had really tried hard to tell them what would happen when they reached Jerusalem. He had told of his trial and of his suffering and of his death and of his resurrection. 
But maybe they were so used to hearing him speak in parables that they interpret his straight talk of death and resurrection as an analogy for leaving his teaching and healing ministry and establishing a new government in which he was king. If this was to be, would he not draw his new leaders, his governors, and his generals from his disciples? The disciples, particularly James and John, could not think beyond the present patterns of power set by Rome. They had given everything up to follow Jesus. So it's understandable that they're looking for some kind of compensation for their sacrifice and their hard work. But they're striving for leadership and self-promotion divided the group. The other ten heard of this conversation. They lost their tempers. And James, with James and John, and Jesus had to step in and calm everyone down. He corrected them by saying, by reminding them who they were. Power can go to your head, he said. Look <coughs> how the godless rulers throw their weight around. It is not going to be this way with you. He calls them to their true selves. He advocates for a new pattern of life similar to his pattern of ministry, one of servant leadership. Jesus is the epitome of a servant leader, but Robert Greenleaf was the first to coin this phrase for use in business in his 1970s essay, Servant as Leader. He taught that the servant leader is servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. And then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. The, that person is sharply different from the person who is leader first, perhaps because of the need to assuage an unusual power drive or to acquire material possessions. The leader first and the servant first are two extreme types, and between them there are shades and blends of all parts of infant, the infinite variety of human nature. The difference manifests itself in the care taken by the servant first to make sure that the other people's highest priority needs are being served. And the best test for this, which is difficult to administer, is to ask, do those served grow as persons? Do they become wiser, uh, healthier, freer, more autonomous, and more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least privilege of society? Will they benefit or will they be further deprived? Listen to the core of that last bit of the message again. The measure of a servant leader is personal growth in those served. They become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, and they become servants too. When servant leadership works well, the least members of society benefit. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Jesus called the disciples to be their true selves as servant leaders. Last week, we heard how Jesus entered Jerusalem on the donkey. Finding that donkey, to me, seems like a pretty menial task. Not unlike going to yet another committee meeting to plan the work of our church. The inglorious details of church business are necessary, but they don't really feel like action. <coughs> church work and donkey fetching are gritty work. Yet they are facets of service that fit into the great arc of Jesus' redemptive work. There can be a lot of gritty work in servant leadership. Buddha 
says, your work is to discover your world and then with all your heart, give yourself to it. American poet W.H. Auden says, you owe it to all of us to get on with what you're good at. Theologian Frederick Buechner wrote, the kind of work that God usually calls you to is the place where your deepest gladness meets the world's hunger. One way of listening to your God-given vocation is to listen to your life. Parker Palmer, who wrote a book on vocation, suggests that hearing a sermon like this might propel you to lofty ideals and the following careers because they are virtuous, maybe noble, but it's not being true to ourselves or true to God's plan. Not everyone is meant to be a teacher, a doctor, a missionary. Parker suggests that before telling your life what you intend to do with it, that we need to listen so that we can hear what truths are embodied in us, what values are prime for us. Parker says that our lives will speak to us through the unfolding events around us, through our actions and reactions, through our intuitions and instincts, our feelings, and our body states. Thomas Merton, a Trappist monk and writer, says it this way, Discovering vocation does not mean scrambling towards some prize just beyond your reach, but by accepting the treasure of true self I already possess. Vocation does not come from a voice out there calling me to be something I am not. It comes from a voice in here calling me to be the person that I was born to be, to fulfill the original selfhood given to me at birth by God. The psalmist sings that God has a plan for us that begins even while we're being knit together in the mother's womb. Each of us is fiercely and wonderfully made. Each of us has been given unique gifts by God, and we discover joy when we use those gifts, and our vocation becomes our work. At that point, our work becomes a conversation with God. Our work is like prayer. Times are tough right now, and yet, 227,000 jobs were added to the economy in February, making it the third month, the third best month of hiring since this recession started. Yet unemployment is still sitting at 8.3%. Many good people are still out of work. Students are graduating from college fully prepared to work and unable to find employment in their field of study. And instead, they're taking any entry-level job available. Where is the hope for the unemployed and the underemployed? I suggest that the hope is still in vocation. Hope is an optimistic attitude that propels people forward with the determination that their goals can be reached. Hope is trustful expectation that God's intention for our future intersects with our faithful response in grateful obedience to God's plan. Hope helps us see the big picture and pushes away fear and despair. By listening to their lives and following their God-given passions, people who are not employed as they want to be can still live with hope. They can last through that season of trial by following their vocation. One woman I know offered me her time and talents while she was out of work. Her vital work for the church family used her skills and kept her motivated during her job search. It was so fulfilling, that behavior, that she began to throw herself into other volunteer work for other organizations that she was passionate about. And the job that she eventually found came from her volunteer work.
her vocation and the network of people that connected to those passions. By engaging in work that was true to her, even if it wasn't a paid job, she remained optimistic, <coughs> motivated, and connected to opportunities. The same is true for retired people and others who choose not to work for pay. When they follow their vocation, the giving themselves for others, they find fulfillment and hope. I was a volunteer for the Girl Guides and then the Girl Scouts for more than 25 years. And I've stayed in touch with several of those girls who became young ladies and I've seen them grow into responsible, caring citizens making a difference in the world around them. I experienced a lot of joy during those years that I served the guides and the scouts because I was following a call to help girls grow into strong, courageous women. And now I'm blessed, ever so blessed, to be living into God's call of an ordained ministry, serving you here at Delmont. If you are also living into your vocation, then say a prayer of gratitude to God. And for those who are in that season of discontent, your homework is to listen to your life, to examine your heart, to spend time in prayer with God so that you <coughs> find the service that God is calling you towards. Amen. Amen.